Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the joint webinar organized by the European Training Foundation and the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Today's conversation is about a very relevant topic, building successful partnerships for skills development. What can you expect from the discussion is to learn what's in for partnerships, how to build a winning partnership, and also to get some inspiration from where your future partnerships. We will discuss this today with our distinguished speakers. We have a slight change on the agenda today. I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Birpi Stuki, Chief of Rural Entrepreneurship, Job Creation and Human Security Division from UNIDO. Welcome, Birpi. Siria Taurelli, Senior Human Capital Development Expert, Coordinator for Governance and Quality Assurance and ETF. Welcome, Siria. And Elfie Klump, Head of Partnership Development at Festo Didactic. Welcome, Elfie. And last but not least, welcome to all our participants joining today. Welcome everyone from wherever you are. I would like to invite you to use the chat to say hi, let us know where you're watching from, and be ready to ask your questions. At the end of this session, we will have a short Q&A where we will try to address your questions. So stay tuned for the next hour. What this organization that we have here today, ETF, UNIDO, and Festo Didactic, have in common is their focus on skills development and their work in bringing together stakeholders for meaningful partnerships. So let's get started with the conversation. We're seeing more than ever that no organization nor business can survive these days if they operate in isolation. So this is why partnership is important. An African proverb says that if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. So my first question for you today is to know how do you engage with partners? Let me start with Verpi. Verpi, before um, your current role, you were a partnership, a business partnership officer at UNIDO. And also you used to manage a number of public, public private development partnership projects. So it would be very interesting for us to know from you if you can let us a bit more uh, how UNIDO at a strategic level works with partners. Over to you, Virpi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Karin, and uh, all the all the audience. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so, to your question, Karin, um, at UNIDO we work at three different levels with partners: at the project level, at the program level, and at the platform level. So, starting with the with the project level. As you mentioned, the methodology we use is called PPDP, Public-Private Development Partnership. And that these are projects where the private, the public and the development partners come together to, to solve a common problem, for example, uh, related to the skills gap. Uh, to give you an example, uh, in a recent project in Zambia, in, in the sector of heavy-duty equipment operators, uh, Hitachi Construction Machinery Company from Japan uh, came to UNIDO because they had sold some equipment to, to the country and uh, uh, struggled finding the operators for the machines. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the government of, uh, of Zambia were also looking into updating their vocational training curricula on, on this uh, domain. And then um, UNIDO also got involved. And of course, skills development is very much in the mandate of UNIDO's inclusive and in industrial sustainable development. So we were very interested in, in coordinating the partnership with, with the financial support, of course, from the government of, of Japan. So this is just an example of a PPDP and where the, uh, the, the partnership composition and all the partners uh, basically need to bring in, in their expertise and comparative advantage of, of the skills domain. Now, let me move into the uh, program level. Um, and here I would like to give an example of a PCP, which stands for Program for Country Partnership. And this is UNIDO's uh, flagship uh, initiative, uh, where uh, basically driven by the UNIDO's member state, uh, we look into the key 
industrial development areas and, and potential bottlenecks. So the PCP starts by um, conducting a diagnostic on what are, what are the key bottlenecks for industrial development. Then it goes into prioritizing the, the bottlenecks because you cannot answer address everything at once. And then the role of UNIDO is to convene partnerships to solve these, these bottlenecks while the government is in the driving seat and basically owning the PCP. And uh, for example, there is a PCP Zambia where one of the identified bottlenecks was skills gaps. And therefore the example I gave you earlier on fits nicely with the PCP uh, Zambia uh, context. And, and finally, going into the platforms, um, UNIDO uh, convenes a number of multi-stakeholder platforms, uh, for example, in the domain of skills development. And the platform there is the Learning and Knowledge Development Facility, the LKDF, which is the co-host of today. Uh, and multi-stakeholder platforms basically are important because this is the place where you can share the, the successes, but also the failures. Some partnership fail. <laughs> and, and basically, it's important for all the partners and different sectors to understand what works and what might not work to be able to then um, replicate the good um, practices and then avoid the shortcomings of, of something that uh, did not necessarily work. So basically three levels, projects, programs, and platforms. Thank you, Karin, over to you. Thank you, Virbi. It is really uh, enlightening to see uh, the different levels where UNIDO works and also that you clearly said there are not only successes, but there are also failures. So it's also very important to always exchange ideas, exchange views, exchange experiences, and then see how can we work better and uh, create uh, uh, new uh, ways of working. So let me go to Syria and um, and also then uh, see what is the ETF experience on that. ETF as an extensive network in the EU and also in its neighboring countries. And this is in continuous expansion. The European Training Foundation is also the only EU agency that is a knowledge hub in human capital development. So, Syria, can you tell us how does ETF promote partnerships in the countries it cooperates with? Over to you, Syria. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, the ETF cooperates with 29 countries and territories. And on some specific projects, it cooperates with even more uh, countries. Uh, and all this cooperation unfolds in the sector of education, training, lifelong learning, skills development for employment. That, that's quite a wide scope of work. And therefore, the approach based on partnership is really central to the work of the ETF. And the key principle is that a partnership should add to what each individual members of the partnership can do and can achieve alone. And this applies to both the type of partnerships that ETF builds together with other international organizations, such as, such as you, such as UNIDO and many others, as well as in the countries uh, the ETF works with. And when we speak um, about each country, of course, uh, what is important is that the stakeholders of education, training, employment, they nurture their own partnership in order to achieve the objectives um, they have in terms of, uh, in terms of skills. Um, uh, we are therefore talking about partnerships that are multi-actor um, multi and that can unfold uh, at various levels, um, at national, uh, local, regional level. Um, because in each um, environment and in each place, there can be uh, one or more uh, different type of, uh, of partnerships. And who are the actors involved in these partnerships? Well, when we speak about skills and development of skills, of course, uh, the actors in the public sector and in the private sector, they become very, very relevant. 
uh, if we think to skills and skill systems that should accompany people to, to employment or to maintain uh, and remain uh, uh, in employment. In effect, in fact, uh, uh, skills and skills policies should be lead to results that are beneficial to the public in general, to the society, as well as to the business sector. But of course, they should be beneficial for the individuals, for them to acquire and maintain uh, and update and develop uh, skills that uh, make them employable, that accompany uh, them to uh, good quality uh, jobs throughout their life. Um, the ETF conducted a study um, and analyzed uh, um, 23 different uh, types and the categories, say, of um, examples of public-private partnerships in the field of skills development. And through this study, we found that uh, uh, these PPPs can focus on knowledge, uh, for example, skills assessment, uh, skills anticipation, but also joint curriculum development. They can focus on uh, resources, for example, uh, laboratory equipment uh, uh, or other type of infrastructures, as well as on the actual provision of skills. And here we have uh, uh, the majority of these uh, partnerships um, um, effectively operating. They can be about work-based learning, they can be about uh, joint delivery or training, joint assessment, uh, and so on and so forth. But that's not enough to define it, to identify these PPPs for skills development. Another important feature is that very often these partnerships are open this uh, was quite a surprise, meaning that uh, uh, new members, new actors, new organizations can join an existing uh, partnership. And another uh, characteristic, also quite important, is that uh, these partnerships uh, can vary in nature. They can be totally embedded into a vocational education and training systems, lifelong learning systems, but they can also be sometime uh, more on a, a pilot stage, they can represent innovative projects and so on. So that is to say that uh, these uh, partnerships for skills development uh, are, uh, are very diverse and, uh, and that's fine. Back to you, thanks. Thank you, Syria. And we can see that the ETF is working on a really wide range of scopes, uh, education, uh, skills uh, and the fact that uh, partnerships are open, so multi-stakeholder, they really embracing and are welcoming all new stakeholders. It is really enlightening. And um, so, and you also mentioned that the private sector is one of the key um, actors that needs to be involved, that you want to be involved. Uh, and we have here today, uh, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce you to Elfie. Uh, from Festo Didactic. She is a representative from the private sector today, working at Festo Didactic in the partner global partnerships. Uh, and for sure, um, Alfie, you have clearly seen how critical it is to build partnership with a variety of actors yourself. So why do you think it is important for Festo to engage with international partners and how do you engage with them? Over to you. Yes, thank you, Karen, and uh, thank you for having me here uh, today. Uh, great pleasure. I would say the short answer would be, uh, as you rightly quoted at the beginning, never go alone, go together. But uh, let me elaborate a bit uh, what we do and how we engage. Um, Festo is uh, a private sector company in of automation technology and in education. We are a global company working in about 170 countries and we are family owned country, a family owned company. So what we do is on one hand, we are in the field of industry. We empower automation in factories. And on the other hand, uh, we have a strong arm in the field of education and skills development. That means we empower uh, people. So empowering 
industry and empowering people for us is in our DNA and goes together. And obviously, uh, having around uh, 300,000 customers in industry around the globe, those all need uh, skills development and uh, uh, people who uh, can bring the innovations uh, to the shop floor. And uh, this is why it is for us uh, so important to engage with the um, industry businesses, of course, uh, with the services industry, but a very strong focus uh, from our company goes also into the engagement with the educational uh, stakeholders. So in other words, we would like to bring together the uh, education industry, the education demand and the industry supply. So our um, purpose is to build uh, the bridge between the industry and the education sector to fill the skills gap and help with our mission, industry development and education and skills development to, to build here um, uh, the bridge and uh, to fill the gap. This is uh, maybe the answer from my side. And uh, as one comment was here in the chat, I like that very much. Uh, this was about uh, the um, importance of partnership, the five eyes. I like that. He said it is innovation, it is information, it is influence and its impact and its increasing capacity. And I think this is a very valuable uh, the, uh, very valuable uh, explanation here. Um, it, uh, it couldn't have been better said by anybody else, I guess. Back to you. Thank you, Alfie. And uh, thank you also for uh, being so proactive and replying to uh, one of the questions from our audience. Uh, we have, uh, you have mentioned that you, have, you are um, engaged in many fronts. You uh, really um, have a mission for empowering uh, the, um, the users of your trainings, and you have also uh, involved, you're also involving educational stakeholders. So this is uh, these are very relevant uh, um, topics uh, and stakeholders to to be mentioned. Um, so let me also then uh, before going to the next question. Um, let me say hi back to all the participants. We are receiving a lot of uh, um, messages from you, uh, a lot of people telling where they are watching from. Uh, so let me just quickly go through a bit some of them. Hi, Jihad. Uh, hi, Mohammed. Uh, hi, Lidana. Um, hi, no, no Brains. Hi, Danila from Bulgaria. Uh, Daria watching from Turkey. It is really a, a, a great pleasure to have so many people watching us. We have Karen also from, um, from Vienna. Um, we have Amelia uh, from Vienna, Inga from Georgia. Thanks everyone. Uh, it is uh, really um, a pleasure to have you here. Uh, feel free to use the chat box to interact with us. We've seen also we're receiving a couple of questions. And we really hope you will leave this session with a lot of insights and inspiration for engaging with future partners. Feel free to use the chat then to share also successful stories uh, from which we can learn from and make this event a platform for exchanging knowledge and best practices. So we said that ETF, Unido and Festo Didactic have a common focus on skills and human capital development initiatives that are inclusive and aim to support vulnerable and marginalized communities. So my next question is really in relation to this. So how do you work with your partners in a way to affect vulnerable communities through skills development initiatives? Uh, let me go to Syria. We have seen how extensively ETF works with the countries it cooperates with and also the extensive network you have built over the years. Could you tell us a bit more about how the work we do with, with your partners creates a positive impact on vulnerable communities? Well, um, the ETF has a range, large range of, of projects that address social inclusion and uh, particularly pay attention to youth, um, unemployed, uh, unemployed women, 
and, and other uh, vulnerable groups. There are also European Commission uh, important programs that really focus uh, on these uh, uh, groups of population. I can mention the Youth Guarantee, which was very recently extended to the Southeast European uh, uh, countries that really aims at bringing more uh, young people and unemployed young people into the labour market with satisfactory employment. Uh, I want to mention uh, two examples, uh, two cases of public private partnerships that are really instrumental to, um, to address the issue of, of inclusion. One in Serbia and one in Belgium. The one in, uh, uh, in Serbia is actually a partnership at local level that engages uh, uh, training centers, educational center uh, provision, institutional provision, and companies. And through this partnership, they are brought together with the support of, uh, of mediators. And uh, the thing is, what this partnership does is really to offer to young uh, unemployed people dedicated services such as uh, individual career guidance and counseling, also group career guidance, uh, an assessment of the competence they have, and then they support these young people to enter into work-based learning programs. And after that, uh, there is a support to uh, match with, with employers. There are other services provided to them, such as uh, um, training on soft skills, on key competencies that uh, people may, may be missing. Um, and uh, what's really striking is that the employment rate at the end of this program is, is really, really high. The other example comes from a European member states, Belgium in particular, and here the public employment service, or so the public actor in the uh, on the public uh, um, governmental side uh, as allied with uh, a non-governmental organization who is able to uh, also offer dedicated services to unemployed people, in particular people possessing a um, immigration background. So they are accompanying and supported uh, uh, until a job is, uh, a satisfactory job is found. And uh, in both examples, you know, we found that through this partnership, there is convergence between the world of uh, education and training uh, and the world of employment. But there is need for uh, this mediation to occur. There is need for the additional services which would not be offered by uh, anyone else uh, uh, unless there was this partnership. And another. Uh, uh, aspect I would like to highlight that uh, also these cases brought, bring attention to the fact uh, that non-government organization or civil society beside the business partners uh, also play an important role. So when we uh, think about uh, partnerships for skills development, we have to think to a variety of actors, including uh, civil society organizations, because they are able to act as a uh, uh, facilitator very often between uh, the world of education and the and the labor market and, and and the private sector as such so we have a triangular relations which also can uh, um, create a strong value for for the learners for the people back to you Carrie. thank you Celia it is uh, really impressive uh, uh, what you've just mentioned that also through your activities uh, you have made an impact in terms of the increase of the employment rate and, and also as you said uh, the uh, partnership also with the civil society is really key uh, so this triangular uh, type of partnership um, becomes really relevant especially when when you're looking to create greater impact uh, so let me then go now to VRP um, you directly support women from rural areas at UNIDO and provide them with the necessary skills for a better and empowering future. Can you share with us uh, your experience um, on this and how partners work with you towards achieving this goal? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Karen, for the question. Um, as you mentioned, we do work, our, our target um, beneficiaries are women, youth, 
and vulnerable population. And um, I would like to describe the, the main methodology that we use when uh, to ensure that we target the right segment of the of the community. And, and um, uh, in any skills project, whether it's a technical skills or entrepreneurship skills, we start by diagnostic. So whether it's a value chain or whether it's a broader market diagnostic, but um, we need to know where the vulnerable um, groups are. Um, just to give an, an example, in, a, in an ongoing project in Egypt on women economic uh, empowerment, uh, there are some selected value chains that are part of the project. And um, UNIDA has conducted a thorough diagnostic to, to understand where, in this case, uh, women are in these uh, value chains. And once we know that, we can tailor the skills development programs accordingly. Uh, it, it really varies a lot, so we should not assume anything. Uh, for example, in the sector of medicinal and ar aromatic plants, uh, the conclusion is that uh, women are not really present um, in this, this um, value chain currently. So the, the design of the skills program has to be very different in comparison to, for example, the handicraft sector, where which is mainly a women dominated sector and, and the skills programs there are then related to very different um, topics like e-commerce and, and quality and finishing and branding of products. And another example um, is uh, from DRC, where UNIR has uh, recently conducted a analysis and diagnostic using something called market systems development approach, MSD approach, uh, to, to find out the, the key market failure uh, behind the skills gap. And, and the results are, are test out, but based on that uh, diagnostic, the, the pro project team could then design the program and also involve and including with the different uh, partners, whether public or private or development partners, um, in a way that really focuses on the most vulnerable groups. And then, of course, um, once we have uh, um, designed a program, a skills development program, uh, we should communicate um, about it and definitely share lessons so that um, others can learn um, fr from the experience of, of UNIDO in this domain. Thank you so much. And over to you, Karin. Thank you, Virpi. Thank you for also um, explaining, going through the type of methodologies, uh, how UNIDO um, tries and creates an impact uh, and uh, supports the vulnerable and marginalized community through, for instance, a market system uh, development that looks at the root causes of poverty. So in order to create a, a transformative change. Um, so, and you're also working a lot uh, with Festo Didactic, uh, and here now I'm uh, going to you, Alfie, and we know that Festo Didactic is involved in many public-private development partnership initiatives, also with UNIDO, and you are trying in your work to address the skills gap with a specific attention to vulnerable and marginalized communities. And this requires a massive effort of collaboration with partners. So how do you uh, work with your partners on these type of initiatives? Over to you, Adi. Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, maybe in line what my colleague uh, Virpi just said, she elaborated in, in uh, how uh, UNIDO is approaching uh, the project from uh, diagnostics uh, to implementation. And this is where we come into the picture from a private sector perspective. We try to bring our expertise to the table uh, from our business experience, from our industry experience, but of course also from our uh, education and skills development experience and try to match, uh, let's say, the requirement framework 
uh, set by uh, a public par partner like Unido. And this is where and how we come into uh, the picture and try to serve, to accommodate, to advocate with our um, tools uh, in, from uh, the education sector uh, to round up, so to speak, uh, the project. We have done uh, with uh, UNIDO, uh, and uh, of course, this also needs finances um, and uh, uh, financing aid um, uh, agencies, um, several projects. And maybe to mention one is uh, the so called H2O uh, MACREC project. This uh, project is dedicated to improving the uh, municipal and industrial wastewater sector in the country of Morocco. And it was uh, under the, the leadership of UNIDO and uh, financed with uh, USAID. And this is, has become very sec successful over the uh, past three years. And uh, now, of course, we have our lessons learned together with the trilateral partners here involved. But uh, the project is um, at the point where we are thinking also to replicate and duplicate it uh, with the lessons learned, so to speak, in in other country. And uh, as we are in the section in, in the in the session here together uh, with Unido today, this is a wonderful example between two partners, Unido and uh, Festo, from the private uh, sector perspective. On the other hand, uh, to stay in this uh, context, we are contributing to a platform uh, which is uh, under uh, UNIDO LKDF. It's a learning and skills development platform. And uh, you might have, I thought, a link here in the chat. And uh, the audience uh, here in the session today might have a look uh, to this platform. It's a wonderf wonderful, ex another example of public-private partnership and uh, full of resources uh, free uh, to access. Um, I also would like to underline a point that uh, Syria mentioned uh, before um, when it comes to partnership, the civil society. I think in the receptive countries of the uh, public-private partnership projects, is, uh, it's crucial to involve uh, stakeholders of the civil society uh, to accommodate and also to um, uh, create the, ne the necessary impact of the project or the, to create the, 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 the foundation uh, that the project can make a tremendous impact and be successful. This is about what we do. Of course, at Festo, we have numerous other uh, public-private uh, partnerships uh, with other stakeholders around the globe as we are uh, working uh, uh, with business and uh, ministries of education or labor market orientated uh, agencies. So I uh, welcome uh, you to have a look at our webpage uh, if you would like. And now back to you, Karen. Thank you, Alfie. Um, first of all, thank you also for mentioning uh, uh, the work you do uh, with UNIDO and the LKDF platform as a multi-stakeholder platform. And we are happy actually to have this webinar with you, both ETF and uh, Festo, with whom we are strongly collaborating on different fronts. Uh, at project level, at uh, advocacy level, we are also organizing a number of um, events and uh, awareness uh, raising um, um, initiatives uh, such as uh, this webinar um, and I would also like to uh, just add that we are receiving a lot of feedback from uh, the audience uh, thank you so much for this uh, we will try and uh, uh, address some of your questions uh, um, a bit later on um, and we have seen that it is widely recognized also from all your interventions that organizations uh, that actively seek partnerships and collaborate with each other, they tend to perform better and they can achieve greater impact. Partnering becomes even more effective when it comes to also dealing with uh, complex environments that require expertise and collaboration among different sectors and where you also look for complementarity in your partners in order to make it a winning partnership. 
So my following question is really to learn from all of you what are the key factors uh, uh, for a successful partnership. Uh, let me start with um, with Alfie. So Alfie, I'll go back to you uh, again. And can you um, share what are your views? What are the key factors for building a successful partnership? Well, in my opinion, uh, the, the, the most important factor is people, the brightness of people, the people you bring together in the organizations and uh, uh, the working together. Uh, this is for me a, a, a crucial, uh, uh, a crucial uh, element. And then, of course, uh, innovation, yeah, to drive things forward. Uh, and here we can uh, bring a lot of innovation from our perspective, from the private uh, sector perspective, from the uh, clients and partners we have around us. Uh, that is a, a crucial success factor. And uh, I would consider this, um, and then of course the tools uh, where we are dedicating our mission uh, in uh, education, in uh, digitalization, education in Industry 4.0, edu education in green technologies, uh, becoming more and more important. Uh, this is uh, giving us a lot of, uh, yeah tailwind for elaborating uh, on future public-private partnerships. So it's a people, it's innovation, and then, of course, uh, it's uh, bringing the right stakeholders uh, on board. Of course, you need always, let's say, an, 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 uh, a public driver and an, uh, a business partner. And, of course, you need a, a financing source. Um, and uh, as uh, Syria mentioned, stakeholders in the country, civil society, to complete this picture, which brings me back to your intro, Karim, where you said, uh, never go alone, go together. So this is uh, stakeholders, the third point. And um, maybe uh, as uh, mentioned in the last point, this is, uh, if this is all uh, correct, brightness of people, innovation, stakeholders, then the impact and the success speaks for itself and will take the necessary flow in a certain uh, in environment. Thank you, Alfie. This is really enlightening, uh, especially um, that you came up with the as the first uh, uh, thing, thing you thought about people, so the human side, uh, working together, collaborating, uh, and also innovation. Uh, in order to be um, more prepared for the twin transition, which is green and digital. Um, I also uh, would like to know what is uh, uh, ETF takes on that. So, uh, Syria, what do you think are the key success factors uh, for building a, a successful partnership? Over to you. Yes, uh, well, I will try to add uh, to what Elfie said. I can only agree with uh, what she mentioned earlier. Um, if, if I have to um, put additional element, ingredients, uh, in, ingredients for success, I would say uh, partnerships uh, uh, should build on co-designing, co-shaping, uh, um, making partnerships personalized to the extent possible. There is no a unique model. There is no, as I tried to say earlier, not a single template. Partnerships can be very different. So it's important to take time to plan. Partnerships are not improvised. They, they do not, they do not uh, uh, emerge overnight. Uh, there is a need to nurture agreements, to discuss, uh, to find solution in a way that uh, if resources are mobilized, because we are talking about resources, uh, human resources, uh, our time, uh, the expertise, uh, budget, financial resources, uh, uh, and so on. They are used for benefits. It's important that uh, uh, partnerships lead to, to positive outcomes, to benefit for the people, the learners that acquire the skills. Uh, they should acquire good quality skills that help them uh, throughout their life. And uh, another, uh, uh, you know, talking uh, about ingredient for success uh, is continuous collaboration because it's the collaboration on a daily and a weekly basis that forge the partnership. Again, the partnership is not established as a functioning or effective from day one. It is an evolving process and 
through commitment on collaboration, the partnership can, can be reinforced, can grow, can develop and can be stronger in terms of innovation. And innovation also was, as mentioned by, by Helfi, uh, I agree with her. Uh, I would say also partnerships as such, they can be innovative. They can represent uh, um, an element or a good practice for more participatory governance of skills development so that all the different actors are uh, uh, recognized, their uh, contribution is acknowledged, is utilized in full. And I think if we move on to innovation in learning, innovation in skills development, but also in uh, innovating the instruments we use, the, the type of governance approach, um, we we have achieved a very good result. Thank you, Celia. Uh, it is indeed true. Uh, building partnership takes time. So, uh, and as you said, you also, in order to create the relationship, to build the relationship and create um, a type of relationship of mutual trust. So, and this is also a way to, um, and also where you also need a lot of commitment in maintaining this partnership. So, what is uh, Unido's uh, take uh, on how uh, on on the key factors for building a successful partnership? Over to you, Virbi. Thank you so much, Karin. I, I have an easy task because I can only agree with Elfie, Syria, and you, you, Karin. But let me take another kind of way to the, the way I see partnerships. So, partnerships are relationships. Uh, equally to what, what Elfie was telling, these are about people. And as in a relationship, you have to <clears throat> start by, by building the trust. And this takes time. Often it can, uh, sometimes it can take years as in, in relationships. And, and during this trust building, you examine, are, are your values the same? Do you share mutual interest? Is the purpose of the partnership the same? You, do you share the, the same, same goals and, and so forth? And you have to invest in this uh, trust building um, because it's a relationship at the end of the day. Um, then once you have established the trust, you as in a relationship, you might marry and you sign a paper. So partnership, you might sign a joint declaration or MOU or a, a joint project. So you basically tell the whole world that we are together. We want to work together. We, we agreed, we commit, we are committed and, and we are investing in this partnership. And in this kind of formalization phase, it's important that um, everybody knows their roles and responsibilities, their, their accountabilities. Um, the good thing about these, these uh, partnerships is also that you can share the risks um, or even failures, but also, of course, you can celebrate the rewards uh, together as a partners. And um, once you have formalized your partnership, you start basically building your life, your, your, your implementation, you, you expand, you, you work together. And then especially if the partnership is um, successful, you should definitely replicate it or scale it up and communicate about your, your successes or even failures so that everybody can learn about this. So partnerships are relationships. Thanks a lot, Therapy. And thanks for also making this uh, um, um, example for uh, and putting partnership as relationships indeed. So we have heard a lot about uh, to, today and in these uh, um, last interventions about how important it is to have a multi-stakeholder collaboration, about being open to bringing new partners, about uh, building trust for uh, and not only uh, to start um, a partnership, but also to um, be committed and um, also have a, a long standing type of partnership. But on, in order to do that, uh, you also need to be committed. You need to communicate. You need to uh, maintain a relationship of mutual trust. And you also need to have 
uh, you need to be aligned and have uh, common values, common interests. So let's try to make a wrap up before taking some questions. And let me ask uh, the speakers with us today about their takeaways from today's discussion. Let me start uh, with Celia. Well, I, I think that uh, part, my ma major takeaway is that the partnership approach can uh, deliver uh, multiple forms of, of agreements, of collaborations. Uh, and the important thing is that these agreements, collaborations and partnerships, they lead to beneficial results for the learners, for the people who are learning new skills and competencies and can find their way uh, in the labor market. Thank you, Celia. Um, Birpi? Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, similar to Elfi, I wrote down the, the one of the first comments about the five eyes. So thank you, Marsa Marga, who wrote these comments, uh, comments, and I repeat it once more. The four, uh, five eyes: innovation, information, influence, impact, and increasing capacity. So I definitely learned from this webinar. Thanks a lot. And this, this summarizes for me the, the discussion. Thanks a lot, BRP. And thanks also to our um, uh, participant from the audience, Marsa Marga, for this uh, uh, for these lessons learned for, for all of us. Um, Elfie, then uh, let's also uh, get some uh, key takeaways from, from you for, from today's discussion. Yeah, maybe three points. Uh, I definitely like, like uh, as a first point, those five uh, eyes that we all appreciate now and uh, take away. The second one is the multi-stakeholder uh, approach, uh, which tells me that uh, diversity brings together a good uh, thing to develop and uh, create another evolution and create uh, bigger projects in, 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 in a partnership. And the third thing, I like that uh, marriage uh, example from Worthy relationship uh, uh, is partnership and the partnership is relationship. Maybe those three. Thanks a lot, Elfie. Um, so let's then go back to uh, our audience. Uh, we've received a, a huge number of questions. Uh, we will try to uh, address uh, some of them. Um, uh, I would like to ask the first question that we have received to, to Syria, which is really related to ETF. So um, the question is, does ETF establish partnership at local um, level? for instance, like through EU delegations in a given country or at central level. Can you uh, explain us a bit more, Syria? What, is, what does the ETF do? Yes, um, ETF uh, established also on its own initiative, uh, sometime partnerships uh, with the help of uh, European Union delegations in the various, uh, in the various countries. Uh, and this very often concerns a partnerships and alliances, I like to say, between uh, uh, different uh, governmental agencies. It could be ministries, also implementing agencies. It could be tripartite uh, uh, councils on skills, on vocational education and training, as well as, uh, you know, together with, with private sector. I would say this is uh, perhaps the most frequent type of uh, action run implemented by the ETF, bringing the whole range of public stakeholders together with, with the private sectors. Uh, there are other type of partnerships. For example, the ETF has started a number of networks uh, and these networks uh, have their own dedication. You know, we have a network of innovative teachers. Another network launched by the ETF is about uh, uh, skills development, skills anticipation, and it engages researchers. And another network, the most recent one, which I'm uh, uh, proud to, to mention here, is the GLAD network. And GLAD stands for Governance, Learning, Action, and Dialogues. And in GLAD, the concept of partnership is really 
central, is quintessential, because what we want to do is really to promote, encourage and value the partnerships and alliances within each and every country. Thanks a lot, Syria, and thanks a lot, Vola, for your question. We hope we have been able to address your question. Um, then let me go to another question that I would like actually to ask to, to both VRP and Alfie to have a different uh, perspective. And this is the question from Jaime. So uh, the question is, uh, uh, do local enterprises take part in uh, such partnership? Is the motivation of international and domestic enterprises same, different? Do they contribute to benefit from those partnerships differently? And I know that you've both uh, been involved in a lot of uh, uh, projects, specifically also supporting local enterprises. So maybe it would be interesting to have your view on that. We maybe can start with Virpi. Okay, and thanks a lot, uh, Karin, and thanks Jaime for the for the question. Um, I would uh, not see. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the PPDP projects that I have been involved in, and I don't see necessarily a big um, difference between the domestic, uh, domestic and international en enterprises. I see difference between the size whether it's a multinational or or small enterprise and um, i mean in in the case for example in morocco we do have uh, local um, multinational companies involved in in south africa we have also local companies involved um, and uh, so they they do local enterprises do take part in partnerships. So that's the first part of the question. Um, the mot motivation of international and domestic, uh, same or different, it might be. Um, of course, multinationals might have more uh, capacities to, to focus on um, or, 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 or resources to focus on, for example, um, um, like uh, social responsibility issues, um, not saying that the locals are not taking care of that, but it's more that they have, uh, multinationals have more resources for that. Um, and then do they contribute and benefit uh, differently? Uh, yes, I would say also, because if it's a big company, the, the, the expectation is that um, they contribute something to the partnership in terms of resources, whether it's in kind, um, time, uh, it, it could be equipment, it could be a, a technical expertise, and in some cases also um, financial resources. Whereas a small enterprise for um, locally might not necessarily be able to, to have similar contribution. Um, and therefore, we would need to design the partnership set up a little bit differently, um, depending on the size, size of the company. So <laughs> I would like to hand over to, to Elfi um, for, the, for, for elaborating on this question. Yes, thank you, Jaime, for the question. And I think uh, Virpi has uh, covered a major point. I would also um, say, first of all, indirectly local business is always uh, have a, 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 a share in it as well. Because the, uh, when you come to a country and uh, you get in touch with different people, with different stakeholders, so indirectly you can take, uh, can have an influence uh, on ideas, on uh, cap capacity, on investment or whatever. But I would say, um, it depends on the project, depends on the size, and it depends on the stakeholder involvement. Um, and of course, um, as an international uh, company, my guess would be that you have a different interest than a local company. Local company, obviously, you want to develop your local market first before you go international. From the international coming to a country, it's you go there because you want to develop the market from outside, but work together. And here comes the partnership uh, in place with the local stakeholders. 
But Thank I you. think uh, in general, this is a really wide uh, uh, discussion and uh, certainly a very valuable question. Thanks a lot, Elfie, and also Jaime for posing this question. Um, Syria, do you have uh, something that you would like to also add uh, in this regard? I, I would like to add and also turn uh, to, 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 the, to the person uh, with, uh, with another question. Are we um, talking about domestic and international uh, uh, differences here? It is quite general. Shouldn't we talk about uh, differences given by prior experience of uh, mm. social dialogue, social partnership? Because this could be the this could be the sometimes the origin of a difference in uh, countries or regions or areas or territories where there is a pre-existing uh, uh, tradition, long tradition of uh, social dialogue. Uh, then what we found in ETF studies that the partnerships uh, are more easy to develop. They they come from far somehow, whereas where this tradition is uh, is more uh, recent or is under development. Uh, then partnerships are uh, uh, also experiencing more difficulty. But I would say at the same time, they are more creative because they don't have an old legacy of pre-existing uh, behavior and attitude and so on. And therefore in countries with less tradition of cooperation between public and private, we also find more uh, creative solutions. So I would not say international or domestic, but depends very much on the, uh, say, legacy, tradition, uh, and also environment, mm. which, is, which is there at the moment. I hope this helps. Thanks a lot, Syria, also for this um, clarification and also to bring in also the different perspectives that also come into play. So I think that it is um, time now to finalize today's conversation. We are well on time, so I'm really glad for that. We have heard today a lot of interesting perspective and we've received a lot of interaction from our audience, a lot of questions. Thanks for having shared that with us a great number of comments and questions. Uh, we see that there is really an interest in continuing this conversation and we are happy to do so on the ETF open space or by contacting us uh, directly through our channels uh, that we have indicated in the chat. Um, we know that we have not been able to address all questions, uh, but we are happy to do so uh, through the online community. Um, also, uh, you have also received in the chat box a lot of information regarding uh, studies, uh, um, such as uh, the uh, diagnostic study and also a lot of other informations uh, uh, regarding the three organizations that we have here today. So let me first of all congratulate uh, BRP, Syria and Elfi for the great work you are doing. Thank you for having shared with us your experience and your insights today. A big thanks to the ETF and UNIDO's LKDF communication teams. Thanks for your immense support. This event would have not been possible without, without you. And thanks to all of you, uh, all our audience for today for being with us and for having interacted with us. I would like to uh, invite you to follow UNIDO, ETF and Festo Didactic on the social media channels and to stay tuned for future initiatives. I wish you all a lovely continuation of the day. Thanks again, VRP, Syria and Alfi. And thanks everyone. Uh, have a lovely day. And thank you, Karin. Exactly. Thanks, Karin. <laughs> thanks, Karin. And thanks to the audience. Thanks, everyone.